This week, we're joined by Jacob Infante. Um, Jacob, I know you through Twitter. I don't know if you're on any other social media platforms. So nothing that I produce football content on. Everything like football related, you'll find on my Twitter. So that's just at Jacob Infante 24. The biggest roadblock that could potentially happen would be the quarterback play, right? Like uh, it's a rookie quarterback, so we're not sure what we're going to get. But say the rookie quarterback does play well. What is the next potential roadblock or obstacle you think that this team might face in this next upcoming season? It's tough to say because you look at this Bears roster, there are way fewer needs than there were even a year ago this time last year or you know, especially this time two years ago. Uh, I think Ryan Pohl's done a really good job of fixing a lot of important needs that they have on both sides of the ball. I'd say maybe offensive line, and I say that solely because you know they brought in Coleman Shelton who – was you know a league average center, and that's a massive upgrade over what the Bears had with Cody Whitehair performing poorly, uh, Lucas Patrick performing poorly, and just overall bad center play over the last couple of years. In theory, that should be a good upgrade, but at the same time, I don't think they have a star on the offensive line yet. I think Darnell Wright could be that guy. I think Tevin Jenkins could be that guy. Nate Davis is coming off of a disappointing year. Obviously, he he's in line to start at right guard, but there's a potential that if he puts together a season similar to last year, then he's going to see the out in his contract exercise two years into his three-year deal. Uh, And Braxton Jones, I think, is better than a lot of people give him credit for. He's not a star left tackle, and I feel like he'll struggle against top-tier edge rushers, and he has, but he can hold his own. It's not a bad offensive line by any means, and it's gotten better to the point I don't think they need to go offensive line in round one. But at the same time, there's still a lot of question marks there. So I'd say that's probably the biggest obstacle. Uh, There are probably others that could stand out. But at the same time, uh, I think there's still a decent amount of question marks that I can't definitively say, all right, this is going to be a great offensive line next year. David, right when you asked me this throughout the week, immediately one name jumped to my mind, and that's Matt Eberflus. Going 0-4 last year was not good. I still have some concerns, and you've seen the cycle repeated by the Bears before with, you know, drafting a quarterback while keeping a coach for his last year and this and that. We were this close, this close to finally having a complete turnaround, right? And so it it does kind of go back and feel the same a little bit where, hey, this coach might be in his last year here trying to save his job with a rookie quarterback. If the quarterback's playing well, but other things are going wrong. If if the defense has given up a fourth quarter lead, oh, Matt Eberflus, his yeah. head is on the chopping block. You know, if this team is healthy, we're going to go really far. What what you're saying is, is that you don't have depth, right? Like, and basically, like top to bottom, right now on this Bears team, I look at it and I go, yeah, every position looks super stacked as a starter. I found it interesting how Ryan Poles approaches free agency and how he goes and he's basically doing back end of the draft moves through free agency special teamers, backup free safeties, backup strong safeties, backup linemen. He's doing this on like two-year deals with uh, free agents, basically, which is not necessarily a bad idea, but I rack my brain trying to think of what team has done this in the past. What team has built depth through free agency rather than depth through the draft, right? And if you're going to do that, you have to have top-end talent at the beginning of your draft. So you need first and second rounders to become superstars so that you can trade away third and fourth and fifth round picks for like depth pieces instead of drafting them. So my biggest obstacle or roadblock is just depth. Because in my mind right now, if Jervon Dexter goes down, you're starting Zach Pickens. If Keenan Allen goes down, you're starting Tyler Scott. If uh, Tevin Jenkins goes down, you're starting Ryan Bates or whoever else, right? You're starting Ryan Bates at left tackle if Braxton Jones goes down. If anything happens, and as we know, it's like a 17-game season, it's three games of the preseason, it's 100% injury rate at this point in the NFL. Somebody's going down, and right now there's too many positions across the board that if they go down, I don't trust the backup. So my roadblock would be depth. I think that's definitely valid. Historically, a lot of the best teams tend to identify depth through the draft, and they find some of those mid-round picks that can develop well under high-end starters. Those high-end starters leave in free agency. They provide comp picks, and, oh, we already have the replacement in store. So uh, it's going to be interesting for sure to see uh, maybe higher floor but lower upside depth additions. I think that's going to really help out on special teams. But if guys get hurt, I don't know necessarily how valuable that's going to be on offense or defense. So 
I mean, I think that's a valid point for sure. The biggest thing that I've appreciated about Ryan Poles moving forward is his patience in the sense of like where to add people and how to add people. And there's a lot of off season left and I, you know, training camp cuts are a real thing, right? Like training camp cuts, uh, post draft cuts. Um, Hunter Renfro is a free agent still for God's sakes. Like you need a slot receiver and you haven't picked up Hunter Renfro. Like, what are you doing? There's definitely still some depth to be added. So I'm not panicking yet, but in terms of obstacles right now, like I think Paulie has the best answer where it's, it's the coach. Like I don't know yet if Matt Eberflus is a good coach yet. It does feel like the Chicago media though has already begun to project their feelings about Caleb Williams and you know, the hatred due to fields, like you hear this whole, he better perform or else narrative. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I think the best rookie season in, in NFL history, or at least in modern history was Cam Newton in his first year. Um, and he had, a, I believe, a little over 4,000 yards passing, 700 yards rushing. Uh, he had D'Angelo Williams and uh, Jonathan Stewart with him on that team. Um, his Steve Smith team, and Greg Steve, Olson, too. Yep, Steve Smith Sr. Uh, Greg Olson. Greg Olson. Yeah. And then the backup was uh, Jeremy Shockey. So he had so, some weapons on that team, and they still went 6-10, and 10, right? So Caleb Williams is a rookie, and – what do you think is the actual realistic type of projection here for this kid this year? The real expectations that you're looking at with Caleb Williams is he should be one of the better rookie performers we've seen at the quarterback position in some time. And the way that I say that is because having evaluated him, uh, I mean, I went through and watched every single one of the passes that he's thrown in college. So that's, kind of insane of me, but at the same time, it goes to show in, in my process of watching him and identifying uh, his strengths and weaknesses, I see someone who can contribute at the NFL level right away, make an impact and eventually develop into a potential superstar player. There's a bit of expectation for him to perform very well because of that. There's a prominent media member who said that this is the best surrounding, like supporting cast that a number one pick a quarterback has had in the last 30 years at least. The fact that the number one pick didn't come from Chicago's own poor play, you're looking at now DJ Moore and Keenan Allen at wide receiver, an up-and-coming offense, a strong defense. There's a lot to like there in Chicago. So you're throwing in a a high-end blue-chip quarterback prospect. The expectation should be high. It's a rookie quarterback. Even the best rookie quarterbacks, even Andrew Luck coming out, even even Peyton Manning. I know that's 90s. It's basically a different game of football at that point. Even Andrew Luck, even Cam Newton, even Justin Herbert, even Joe Burrow, even Trevor Lawrence, all those highly touted quarterbacks who performed well, they made rookie mistakes. And I expect no different out of Caleb Williams. I expect him to be good. I th- expect him and believe he's going to be an upgrade at quarterback over Justin Fields. But at the same time, I feel like there has to be a level of realism and we need to keep a you know, a more level-headed approach in terms of what to expect out of a rookie quarterback uh, coming out of the gate. Jacob, do you know who uh, holds the rookie record for most interceptions? Most interceptions? Uh, 28 interceptions, yeah. rookie season. I'm going to guess because he's the first name I come to mind. I'm going to say Peyton Manning. It is Peyton Manning, and he is quoted to say that he's going to hold on to that record forever because <laughs> no one in this league now is patient enough to sit there and stick behind a quarterback. If they throw 28 interceptions in a rookie year, you're going to give up on them. So yeah. the, the contradictory thing is that now we have Keenan Allen, you have DJ Moore, you're going to add more pieces, but Caleb Williams is supposed to throw for 4,000 yards also, yet if he doesn't, he's a failure. So rather than giving him excuses as a rookie, we're going to be lambasting him or crucifying a a rookie 23-year-old, 22-year-old, for not having an outstanding performance as a rookie quarterback. He is a rookie. He should underperform your expectations, no matter what the situation he goes into anyway. I think it's unfair in the sense that the expectation now has gone into rookie records NFL records, Bears records, right? 4,000 yards. 4,000 yards from a rookie is unrealistic. But if he doesn't do it by year two or year three, I would understand the criticism. Yes, you'd like him to perform really, really well. But at the end of the day, he is a rookie. So he's going to not meet your expectations. He's going to make some really bad mistakes. 
do you think this narrative would still exist if it was Drake May or Jaden Daniels? Say the Bears do drop back from pick one to pick two and take Drake May. Is all of a sudden Drake May expected to have the best rookie season of all time? Maybe not as high of expectations as what we see with Caleb, but I still think that it's a matter of, oh, May better do really well or else. Daniels better do really well or else. I feel like regardless of who the quarterback would be, even if it's not Caleb, which I expect it to be, uh, those fans are still going to hold him to a very high level just because, all right, hey, you again, you got rid of the quarterback that I want. This new guy, it's like, all right, well, he better be good. you know. I tend to just look at certain stats and things like that. However, I never let it get too far. I never get carried away with just stats yeah. because to me, the eye test and the situational uh, circumstances matter a lot. But when I was looking at Justin Fields, one thing that stuck out to me okay. is I, I look year to year, I look at this uh, analytic that I call the chaos analytic where I look at the total dropbacks. Mm -hmm. that a guy has and then uh, compare it to the amount of pass attempts. So saying, hey, if the offensive coordinator calls a passing play and you drop back with the intent to pass, how often does the ball actually leave your hands versus it becoming a, a rush or a sack or a fumble, something else other than the ball leaving your hands, right? Yeah. And uh, when I broke this down into percentages, the best of the best of them can get around four, five, six percent. I mean, Brady in his last year was at like four percent, meaning only four percent of the time when a pass play was called, he wound up pretty much just getting sacked. I mean, Brady's not about to run it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, most of the league is at around 10 percent. Some mm -hmm. of the more uh, mobile quarterbacks you see 12, 13 percent in Justin Fields' three years, it went 29 percent or 24 percent, 29 percent, and 22 percent. Mm -hmm. So, as a offensive play caller yeah one out of every five pass plays winds up being something else and to me that just shows inability no control over an offensive scheme and so like when you pair it up with the eye test you you see it this kid is light years away from playing the position to the top tier extent that some of these guys in this league play um you know, even Patrick Mahomes said, hey, my first couple of years, I didn't know how to read defense. He's manipulating defenses now. He is. Yeah. He's straight up not only reading them, he is playing with these guys. Peyton Manning was the best of them to do it. And so I think that's one of the things that is a problem with Justin Fields. It's like, yes, he's a great athlete. He's a good dude. He's a great character. He's got great work ethic, this and that. But when it comes to the quarterback position, I just haven't seen that control uh, from a guy who's played the position for years, you know, you'd think it'd be better. So I think even if Caleb comes in and has whatever kind of statistical season for me, uh, there's something to see in comfort out there. You know, when, when I've watched some of his highlights and things like that, I see a lot of comfort at the position from Caleb Williams. So I think a lot of the pressure on Caleb Williams is a projection of pressure that you used to have for Justin Fields. Right. So, when you look at what you expected out of Justin Fields, in year four out of a quarterback, you expect them to make significant strides, significant leaps, and get better and better and better. Whereas now you have a rookie quarterback, but you expect those projections and those leaps to be applied to the to the new guy because you expect him to be better at the position, right? Which yeah. at the end of the day is not fair. Over This isn't Madden, right? I don't even think Caleb Williams needs to be the best rookie quarterback in this draft class to still meet, in my mind, his expectations. He needs to be the best quarterback that the Bears have seen in a while. I think he needs to throw for 3,000, 3,500 yards and make it look, you know, uh, past the eye test, like you said, right? But in terms of what he needs to do to make this team make a playoff run or playoff push, I don't think that Caleb Williams needs to break any records. I don't think he needs to be the best quarterback or even like rookie of the year this year, it would be nice, but I don't think that's a realistic and be what needs to happen. It doesn't make sense for them to maybe take offensive line in the first round, yeah. but I, I've watched powers Johnson. Yeah. And God damn, am I impressed? Like I've watched that guy toss people around and you look at him and go, yep, he's ready for the next level. But uh, yeah. What, what do you think about the upcoming draft and some of the prospects there? You got anybody you like? Jackson Powers Johnson, I think that's you know totally valid to you know to view him in that light. I see him on a, a similar tier. I wouldn't say he's quite at the level of a Tyler Linderbaum coming out of Iowa, but he's pretty damn close. And you, you look at him on the same level as say a Creed Humphrey coming out of Oklahoma, which I think is pretty high praise. 
considering the fact one, I had him as a first round grade. He didn't end up going that high because, you know, for whatever reason, I'll never quite understand positional value, whatever, but That's exactly what it is. Positional value. Yeah. Which I think is, I thought was BS because Preet Humphrey is very clearly a great football player and he has been in the pros. I think Powers Johnson is at a similar level as a prospect. I think Powers Johnson is going to go round one for sure. I wouldn't be surprised. Somewhere around that uh, Dolphins Steelers 2021 range, I wouldn't be shocked if he goes there. If he does fall into the second, then I think that some team's going to get really lucky and be able to take advantage of that because he's young, he's strong, he's athletic. He's intelligent. I think he checks just about all the boxes you could at center. Just the one year as a starter, but even then, his uh, 2022 season, he showed a lot of versatility as essentially Oregon's sixth man along the offensive line. And he was one of the most efficient offensive linemen, granted in you know not a ton of snaps, but still probably, I want to say like 200 or something as the key reserve for Oregon. And he was incredible. And he was incredible again this past year. He's someone that I really like. If the Bears trade back, I definitely consider him. Uh, I think, at least in my honest opinion, you're taking one of Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors at nine or you're trading back. If neither of those guys are available at nine, you trade back if there's a good enough offer. Obviously, that's way easier said than done, but I think it's pretty clear where the value is. Like, you, Look, you're not going to get Marvin Harrison Jr. at nine. You know, just being realistic. So I know there's been some chit chat about Marvin Harrison Jr. recently. And you look at last year, uh, Jalen Carter wasn't going to drop to nine either, but he did. I mean, you never, never know how these things play out. Um, however, I think you're right. The the chances of Marvin Harrison Jr. dropping that far are slim to none. But when you look at positional value, like you said, wide receivers, you can pick them up all throughout the draft. There's not a pass rusher or an interior defensive tackle that you would find appealing with pick nine? I think the Falcons are going to take Dallas Turner, the edge rusher out of Alabama at eight. I just think that makes too much sense. They've invested at wide receiver. They've signed Kirk Cousins, so they have their quarterback for the next couple of years. Edge rushers, always, it's been a massive need for Atlanta for years. They've never addressed it. Turner is a freak athlete. He has the highest ceiling of any edge rusher in this class. I think that he'd make a lot of sense there. He's not my top edge rusher but he's really damn close. So I have Jared Verse as my top edge rusher in this class just because I think he's the safest and the fact that I have really, really similar grades with him, Dallas Turner, and Layat Tulatu out of UCLA. They're all neck and neck and neck on my board in the way that they grade it out. It's just a matter of, okay, how am I going to organize them? Because I think Latu had the best film, but he's got – an extensive injury history, who knows, you know, how, what the medicals are going to look like. We, you know, as outsiders, we don't have access to that information. I can't confidently say, oh, he's going to be fine, you know, because he did have to medically retire in college. Dallas Turner, the most physically gifted of the three, the fastest of the three, but at the same time, I don't think he's the most technically sound. If anything, I think he's the least technically sound of the top three edge rushers. Jared Verse, in my opinion, is the uh, best blend of being a safe pick, being a high-quality technician off the edge, having a good understanding of how to string together movements with your hands in order to shed blocks, both as a pass rusher and as a run defender. And he's a very good athlete, too. I think that that's getting lost as he tested incredibly well. His, his burst off the snap on tape, his flexibility turning the corner, all very good. So versus my top guy, from a pure value perspective, I don't think I'd take him at nine. I'd 100% be down, say, if you trade to like 12 or 13 and he's still there, I'd take him in a heartbeat. And you could pick up maybe, you know, an extra third rounder, maybe a second if you're feeling frisky, if you want to do like a pick swap or something. I don't know. But I do think that if they do trade back, verse would be a great get. Lot two would be two uh, if the medicals turn out all right with him. Again, those are guys I'd be fine with in trade downs. That'd be more after, say, 14 or 15. If you move into the late teens, I'd be completely fine with that because that means you're getting a second round pick. That means that you're adding additional high end value. Uh, but yeah, those are just a handful of the guys that I do like. But if I'm at nine, it's neighbors, Adunze, or try to trade down. 
um, neighbors one, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze two. So if you get neighbors at nine or God forbid, like Roma Dunze, yeah, for sure, that's a can't miss. But like in terms of overall, I think if you don't get that at nine, I think your best move as a franchise is moving back. You need to sit there and pick up some more draft picks, right? You're missing a second round pick. Dropping back from nine would definitely could potentially haul you some of those uh, picks back and whatnot. Uh, what do you think of a guy like Brennan Rice? Because I know he's projected to go in the third round. Um, yeah. Even if we don't drop back from nine, potentially, if he's still available, like in the third round, I mean, he played with Caleb. I expect him to go round three. I like, like you said, that's generally where the consensus is on him. I'm admittedly a bit lower on him than the consensus. I think it's such a stacked wide receiver class that there are a handful of guys who are more polished at this stage who can create better separation than Rice. Personally, I'd rather wait a round or two and take Taj Washington, another USC wide receiver. He's not nearly as big, but he's faster. He's more explosive out of his breaks as a route runner. It creates better separation. Uh, and he had a drop percentage of less than 2% in 2023. I know he had a bit of a drop issue in 2022, but cleaned that up. Uh, he was the higher targeted receiver at USC. So I like Rice. Don't get me wrong. I think that there's definitely potential there. I think he's a good athlete for how big he is. Uh, natural pass catcher, good ball skills. There's definitely stuff to like there. I just don't know exactly if, you know, say if you're projecting him in a wide receiver three role, especially in a, a Shane Waldron offense that, you know, went – pretty heavy on 11 personnel having three wide receivers out there. I don't know if Brendan Rice is a day one starter in the NFL. Right out of the gate, I feel like you could probably find more pro-ready receivers to, who could contribute uh, in that range and maybe even a little bit later, even if they don't have the, the exact uh, upside that Rice has. Yeah, see, when I look at um, draft history, yeah, and like you mentioned, positional value, uh, one thing I keep seeing is that – you know, these wide receivers, they get taken all over the place and oh, yeah. they tend to hit more in later rounds than some of the other positions do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just some names that come to mind. Antonio Brown was a fifth round pick. Tyree Kill was a fifth round pick. Cooper Cup was a third round pick. I mean, last year you had Puka Nakua going yeah. to the fifth round. So you can find guys later on in the draft that wind up coming out and really having some impact um, mm -hmm. on the field right away. And uh, however, when it comes to defensive ends, defensive tackles, Mm -hmm. You look at all these guys like Joey Bose. The only one that's out there is like Max Crosby went in the fourth round. Yeah. But everybody else was like a first or second round pick. And, and so, you know, that's where to me it's like, okay, I get that if that's a need on this team, it, it, you might wind up having to pick a guy in the first or second round. Mm -hmm.